schools where they teach this stuff. Here's off of Wikipedia. It shows you their little cute little picture of how things evolved. The problem is, is they found these uh, tetrapods around this so-called 400 million year mark because that's where they, they found another fossil that they claim is 400 million years old. They found it in the same fossil strata. So we get out our baloney detector. Here's what some evolutionist paleontologists have admitted. We thought we'd pinned down the origin of limb tetrapods. We have to rethink the whole thing. So they lost again. Another so-called transitional is out, the, out, the, out of the picture. That's surprising, but that is what the fossil evidence tells us. This is from a paleontologist at the National Museum in Paris. Definitely no friend of creationists. And, and then finally, these results force us to reconsider our whole picture of the transition from fish to land animals. So here's a guest book entry. It's been a while since I've shared one of these. So right after he accused me of using out of context quotes like I did in the other one, he said, if you don't follow God in his errant book, he'll make you kill and eat your children. Now, if you read those verses, God is condemning, you know, throwing kids into the fire and things like that. He totally misquotes the Bible. But that's not uncommon of the things that people would put in my guest book. So consider the fossil record. If you look at evolutionary predictions, you'd expect there to be gradual change over time. I'm going to show you quotes just from evolutionists. Their view of a tree would be life started in a pond of goo and then evolved over time and you've got this tree of evolution. Here's what one evolutionist said. 120 years of paleontological research later, it has been abundantly clear that the fossil record will not conform this part of Darwin's predictions, nor is the problem a miserably poor record. The fossil record simply shows that this prediction is wrong. He's admitting that the fossil record does not show gradual change. Now, you'd also expect the fossil record to show simple to complex. Here's what an evolutionist wrote. The old Darwinian view of evolution as a ladder of more and more efficient forms leading up to the present is not borne out by the evidence. Finally, you'd expect clear-cut lineages. Here's from Stephen Stanley. The known fossil record fails to document a single example of phyletic evolution accomplishing a major morphologic transition. And hence offers no evidence that a gradualistic model can be valid. And yet we're told that, ev that the fossil record supports evolution. But we're not seeing this kind of stuff in our textbooks. Oh, and identifiable common ancestors. The gaps in the record are real, however. The absence of a record of any important branching is quite phenomenal. What about creation? If creation is true, we believe we'd see an orchard of life in the fossil record, as this example shows here. For example, you'd see, well, let's just go through these. You'd see, you'd see sudden appearance in the fossil record, right, if creation is true. Here's what uh, Grolier Multimedia Encyclopedia said. One of the most difficult problems in evolutionary paleontology has been the almost abrupt appearance of the major animal groups. We find them fully developed. That's what we'd expect if creation is true. Here's what Richard Dawkins admitted, the guy that was in that video where he couldn't think of a single example of a mutation that, that was beneficial. The Cambrian strata, strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sun planting has delighted creationists. We'd expect stasis, which means little change over time. And boy, we find that all the time. The observation that species are amazingly conservative and static entities throughout long periods of time has all the qualities of the emperor's new clothes. Everybody knew it but preferred to ignore it. Paleontologists faced with a recalcitrant record obstinately refusing to yield Darwin's predicted pat pattern simply looked the other way. They refused to see the gorilla in the room. What about monkey man DNA? You know, we've heard for many years that how they share 97, 98% similarity. Well, the biggest illusion behind this argument is if you consider the amount of DNA in our bodies, we're like somewhere, they estimate anywhere between 3 and 5 billion base pairs. Those are the little letters at the very base that form the language, like the letters in our English language. And then you write paragraphs in a book. Even if 97% similarity were true, this still amounts to 120 million base pair differences. Now, if you do the math on this, you'll find that, and Haldane, by the way, was a mathematician, an evolutionist. He showed that in 10 million years, you could only get 160, uh, 1,600 beneficial mutations that were beneficial between humans and apes. Is that enough to account for all the differences that we see? Another interesting thing is if you look at the mutation rates that they came up with by comparing chimps and humans, they came up with a rate where if you do the math, each breeding couple would have to produce 60 offspring 
just to make, just keep equilibrium in the population without the population going extinct because of harmful mutations. I actually sent this to a scientist in uh, Wisconsin, James Crow, who publishes in Nature all the time. He admitted it was a serious problem for evolution. I was shocked at his response. And I asked him, well, why do you believe in evolution? And he said, well, because the other branches of science prove evolution. So in his own field of biology, he could not offer proof for evolution. He admitted this is a serious problem. Here's a study from 2003. Humans and chimps have about 86.7 similarity. When two million base pairs were compared side by side, humans and worms have about 75% similarity, so chimps are less than halfway between a worm and a human, if you go by that. Here's another guest book entry. Only a complete idiot would create a site like this. You, you and I are just smart apes. Well, maybe you're not smart. At least I can spell the word your. <laughs> another guy said, if you put a chimp through the public school system, it would be as smart as a 10-year-old. Well, that's kind of true with humans, too. Put them through the public school, sorry. Okay, the ape-man shell game. Let's look at this uh, thing about how we're related to chimps. Here's the evolution of man and woman. <laughs> well, here's our old trusted New York Times again, huh? Back in 1916, things never change under the sun. Darwin theory has proved true based on this... Uh, Skull they found, discovered in 1910, made the world headlines in 1912. It was actually a fraud. It wasn't exposed until 1953. Can you imagine the number of PhDs written on this? PhD thesis on a fraud. So we got to get out the baloney detector. What about Nebraska man? The professor of uh, American Museum, and, uh, Museum of Natural History said that this was a tooth that was a small voice. It sounded as, is by no means easy to hear. The little tooth speaks volumes of truth and that affords evidence of man's descent from apes. A single tooth, and they came up with that drawing on the left. That's an actual drawing that was in the London Times of an ape. So out of a single tooth, they drew so-called man's ancestor and his wife to boot. All from one tooth.